and Corey. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for today's WCET webcast. We will go ahead and get started. This is part one in our two-part series, The Mechanics of Competency-Based Education. Part one, changing a traditional curriculum to CBE, what it takes and how it happens. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. And this is our first time using Zoom for our webcast. We're very excited about the interactive capabilities and the ability to um, just make it more interesting and fun for everybody to participate by asking questions. The participants should really see the questions that are asked, and you can also add your thoughts, questions via the chat box. The webcast is being recorded, and we'll make the link to the recording available shortly after the live webcast, and then we also post the link to our YouTube channel and make those available from the WCT YouTube channel as well. I'll send out a link to the PowerPoint. And if you have any questions or you want to follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET webcast. And I'll also be keeping an eye on that Twitter feed in case you want to ask questions there or share resources. As we go through today, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. We'll hold those until the Q&A portion so we don't disrupt the flow of the presentation. But if there's something that we need to stop and address, we'll certainly do that. If by chance we don't get to all of your questions, I'll pull those out and share them with the presenters and then hopefully we have time to get those responses back to you in part two. We have a wonderful moderator today, my former colleague and good friend, Callie Morrison, who's the Associate Dean for Alternative Learning at American Public University System. Go ahead and take it away, Callie. Hi, good uh, morning or afternoon, depending on where in the country you are. I'm Callie Morrison, and as Megan said, I am the uh, Associate Dean of Alternative Learning at American Public University System, which means under my umbrella, I have our competency-based programs, our prior learning assessment program, and um, we'll have working on micro-credentials and new credentialing pathways, badges. Uh, so I have a little bit of a, uh, a broad breadth, but I've also been working in CBE, um, not just at APUS, but before that, um, working on researching CBE for my dissertation, which is done and published, and I'm happy for that. Um, as you can see today, I'm wearing my CBEN shirt. Uh, thought it was appropriate for what we're doing today. So I'd like to move on and introduce our speakers. Um, Verna, would you like to start introducing yourself? Uh, well, hello everyone. I am Verna Lowe and uh, I am the Senior Manager for Compliance for Educator Preparation at Western Governors University. And <clears throat> My background is, is that I have been in uh, traditional higher ed and now at WGU for multiple decades. That has been my work and I'm in the field of education, uh, more specifically special education. And so uh, we are just glad to be here to be able to share with you today. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Chuck Hostler. I'm the manager for compliance and accreditation for the College of Health Professions with Western Governors University. Um, I've been in nursing for 34 years and higher education for the past 20. Um, sort of like Kelly, I've served as a associate dean for about 13 of those years and had the fortunate privilege of creating uh, seven new departments and two new schools um, and trying to encourage everybody to go forward with uh, competency-based education with each of those programs as far as we could at that time. Great, so just to reiterate what Megan said, if you have uh, questions throughout the process, I'll be watching. If you see me looking to the side, that's because I have my Q&A and uh, chat box to the side of my camera here so that I can interact with you all in that and I will feed those questions in uh, to Chuck and Verna as appropriate. Um, we've got the agenda here for both sessions, and I'm gonna let the experts here take it away. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for attending this first session. And um, 
We'd like to take a moment to thank WeSit for the platform and the opportunity for this presentation. And Dr. Morrison, thank you for your extreme gift of your time and your, your knowledge and talents. It's much appreciated. Um, today, we wanted to go over a little bit about competency-based education and, and particularly focus on uh, the, the um, characteristics of the CBE model that we use and some of the practices that have supported competency-based education and some of the challenges that we found. In session two, we'll come back with some um, more hands-on demonstrations of actually converting courses and some student testimonials um, that align, that, that, that kind of demonstrate the competency-based education work. Thank you, Dr. Morris. <laughs> so if you'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Western Governors University is kind of unique in competency-based education. It's one of the early adopters. Um, just briefly to cover our history, it was created in 1997 by 19 Western Governors who realized there needed to be something done for workforce in their states uh, for hard to reach populations and students. It was built on the promise that, that WGU would help students achieve academic dreams and career success. And I would like to say that we've been fairly successful just briefly that WGU now services over 110,000 students from all 50 states and six territories. And we have in less in, in 21 years graduated now over 100,000 um, students into the workforce through our four colleges, our bachelor, baccalaureate and master degree program. So, um, if you'd go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of the competency-based education model. And Verna will 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 talk through those, um, particularly the intersection of competence and learning. Verna. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Well, one of the things about competency-based education, the heart of it, is around competence, the ability to demonstrate your knowledge and skill both effectively and efficiently. Um, in CBE, as we call it, one of the things that's very important is that you have measurable descriptions of knowledge and skills, abilities, particular behaviors and attitudes. And those particular uh, things should represent what a student should be able to do at the end of their program. And those would be all, all the competencies would come from those particular knowledge and skill sets. CBE also focuses on learning outcomes and not the activities and not time. It's basically about measuring competence or learning. If you, if you could imagine no seat time and no class attendance, then the burden of proof for competency-based education is really on the attainment of learning. And it's really defined as a mastery of a certain set of knowledge and skill sets that the student will need to be able to perform in the real world of their profession. In this day and age, the instructional delivery of, with technology and online delivery, as well as designing courses through instructional design models that accentuate how we learn, support very well the competency-based model and the integration of knowledge and skill sets. So this sets the stage for competency-based education. Next. <laughs> We'll just discuss it just a little bit more in depth, and we'll keep reiterating one, that first bullet point a great deal, that it measures learning rather than time. But in the second piece, if you look at the second bullet, what happens is that program competencies are established around what is needed out in the workforce in that particular area. And that's what's so important. It's not that we pull out of a hat a set of competencies for a program is actually that we go out there and assure that that is what is needed in the workforce and we can have experts further assure that we have selected the appropriate ones. Also, what is interesting is <clears throat> that once we have the competencies within that program, we can establish courses and assessments. And these are standardized. In other words, a student that's entering a particular program We'll take all the same courses and have all the same experiences. We'll take all the same assessments that have been developed uh, to 
show the benchmarks that are needed to meet the competencies. It would not vary from instructor to instructor. And so this standardization is very important because the competencies themselves have been standardized to that program. Then when we look at what is the, ben uh, when the, what is the benchmark, excuse me, for mastery, one of the pieces that's important here is that we have to have some preset or predetermined types of benchmarks so that we know when a competency has been met and at what level it has been met. So for example, uh, at WGU, what, uh, our mastery level is set at a B level or above. And then one of the nice things about CBE is it accommodates well prior knowledge and work experience. Let's say that a, an individual is in the field of business and they are suddenly getting in their business degree and they're looking at some of the coursework and the assessments and they know immediately that they can do those very well. They can just jump right in and do the pieces that they know very quickly and then they can spend more time on the areas that they need to grow in. And that is kind of self-determined by the individual and that gives them much more control over their learning. But it also acknowledges their knowledge and skill sets that they bring to the program. The overall success of CBE is really based upon that it's so learner focused and it's based upon that it can also be easily accessible to students. It's built around the attainment of competencies so the whole program is success oriented. And along with this, <clears throat> It also helps students reach their dreams because there are some individuals who never thought they could attain that type of education. To illustrate a competency, uh, here you'll see a competency statement. A student will lead a work group in achieving an organizational goal within a designated timeline and budget. Now, since I'm in education, an example would be that uh, in an educational leadership program, there may be a potential principal candidate who would go out and work with a group of teachers in evaluating a curriculum. Now, there would be a performance task built to that with multiple components and then a rubric. And then a candidate would be responsible for all of those pieces and they would be evaluated on the rubric showing that they have to reach a certain level to meet the competency. Chuck, how does it work in health? Well, it works very well. I can give you um, a very specific example of, of a uh, performance task. Um, I was speaking to one of our students actually this, this week, and she was relaying to me an experience where she was able to go into the hospital where she worked. An electrophysiology uh, had, physician had developed a new loop suture to close the artery. Uh, when you take out the large cath um, after doing the electrophysiology studies. And the hospital um, had been trying for months to get a new uh, power plan through their electric health records so that nurses could actually pull that sheath and work with that suture and hadn't been able to do so. And this particular student then, using the knowledge that she'd learned through um, her courses in um, evidence-based practice, was able to go in and lead a group um, to bring the evidence to the table to change not only the practice, but change the power plan within the uh, electric, electronic health record so that nurses could pull that sheath and tighten the loop suture, which would close the femoral artery, allowing patients to sit up in 15 minutes rather than hours. <laughs> change the entire stay for the patient. Um, but I questioned the student. I said, how does this have to do with, what, what does this have to do with your competency-based education? And she very quickly articulated that because of competency-based education, she didn't just take a course in evidence-based health and then pass the test and say that she had the knowledge. She immersed herself entirely throughout her program uh, using the evidence base for every course and every assessment that she did so that when it came time to change this protocol, she had everything she needed to go forth. Um, and I don't know if she effectuated change in nursing practice at that large institution, but because of the electric health, electronic health record changes, it has a potential change in national practice. 
That's a great example, Chuck. <laughs> we can Thank move you. on. We can move on to part two. And um, I think that, uh, I don't think that's the next slide. <laughs> I think we've skipped one. Oh, maybe it is. Okay, good. I think, uh, Chuck, I think you have the next slide. I'm sorry. Yes, if you could go on one more okay. slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about um, actually, Verna, this is your slide, the key to success in seven principles. My apologies. Actually, I think we have to go back. Wow. I think we've skipped a slide. Right there. <laughs> well, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was some of the characteristics of, of competency-based education or CBE. And of course, there are some that are very critical. There are a lot of characteristics, but there are some that are just extremely critical. Some of those are that, you know, Verna already alluded to, the fact that you have to have explicit program and learning outcomes. This can't be just based on um, an idea. It has to, to be based on what, whatever the industry standards are and what the workplace needs so that you can go out and actually assess that learning outcome uh, in a very objectable manner. CBE must be flexible. Students have to be allowed to come in and learn at their own pace and bring their previous life learning to the table. Um, an example of that would be, again, going back to mm -hmm. nursing, students need to learn how to do care plans. But in a traditional model, they might have to spend 13 weeks, everybody learning to do a care plan, whereas somebody who has prior learning skills can come in and mm -hmm. challenge that assessment and demonstrate competence and mastery. There needs to be a variety of instructional activities. We all learn differently. So, it's, so we need to use technology. We need to learn, use visual, we need to, to use everything that we have um, in those instructional activities and learning resources. And one of the emphasis needs to be on student self-directed learning. We all know how we learn best. And because of CBE and the flexibility, we can use what we do best um, to gain the knowledge and to be able to apply it. That goes again to the adaptability of a program. Um, in, at WGU, we use mentors, uh, course instructors, to help give students some expert feedback, but we still allow students to learn and to bring their knowledge to the table and to drive that educational process somewhat, uh, rather than just sitting down. As one student said to me, you can sit down and lecture for 13 hours. I still won't get it. I have to do it before I understand. It has to be measurable, meaningful assessments. So it has not only to assess what a student learns and knows, but how they apply it and how they can use that skill. Um, and therefore, the completion of the competence is demonstrated on that learning outcome or that doing of the, uh, of the knowledge that they've learned. I think we could go to the next slide here. Pause. We have a, we've had a few questions come in. Would you guys be open to answering a few now as we transition? Absolutely. Sure. Um, the first question, and I'm not sure that I'm interpreting this correctly, but Herb asked, Herb Coleman asked, um, that they are expanding CBE to transfer programs so they don't base those competencies on employer ex a, employers' expectations. What would you suggest? And what I was um, what I'm trying to tease out of that is, are they transfer in programs or transfer out programs? So are they degree completion? I think you guys might have different answers depending mm -hmm. on who it is, or if you want to look at it from both sides, what it means to have competencies mapped for transfer in and for transfer out. Chuck, do you want to start? <laughs> well, I can. Yeah. When I think about transferring in, um, I know particularly um, in nursing, it's very important that you, you, you try to assess a person's knowledge uh, based on where they are. And the good thing about competency-based education and, and the assessments that we have is that a transfer in student can, can challenge those assessments to demonstrate that they have competence based on the rubric outcomes that we have established to meet mastery at, a, at least a B level or higher if you want to equate it to a grade. Um, Bernie, in, in teaching, I'm assuming it works similar. 
it does work similar. And I would say in some of those transfer uh, programs too, I would assume that there might be some articulation agreements set up of its particular institutions. And in that way, you could also uh, establish what are the competencies that are needed for them to transfer in. Absolutely. And that's another way of handling that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> We're, we're having some uh, dialogue in the uh, in the chat box as well. So he says transfer as opposed to workforce. Um, academic meaning um, English, history, government, psychology. So what I think he's really asking there is then um, how do you do the uh, the core courses? How do you do the uh, the things where there's not a direct uh, correlation to the workforce. So, for instance, uh, philosophy, history, English, where you're not, you may not have that same um, set of industry standards to peg your competencies to. Okay, um, I'll start, Chuck. You can <laughs> follow. One of the things is, is that there actually are some industry standards for general core courses. And so that's a great way to start with those. Uh, also, you can look at the learning outcomes of the courses and match the learning outcomes to what uh, you are providing at your institution. And that, that matching or alignment can uh, be done pretty easily. Chuck, you have any other uh, suggestions? Verna, I would just expand on part of what you were saying and just respond that, that um, even when uh, teaching a general education course, there are specific outcomes which you want the mm -hmm. student to obtain. It's those outcomes that can be turned around then and built into a competency. Now, certainly they won't be demonstrated in a workforce, but you can measure those competencies and, and the mastery of them by whether or not that knowledge is incorporated into to the um, higher courses that come uh, behind that. You can also, um, you know, just measure competence uh, you know, you were talking about English, the final product should be a well-written English paper. I mean, it can be a competency that demonstrates that you've mastered some of the language skills that are, that are the outcome desired in that particular English course. I don't know if that helps Dr. Morrison. Jared, I also shared in the, in the chat box, um, you know, another thing for liberal arts type courses that you could use is um, AAC and use LEAP, uh, their framework to map your competencies to and then build, you know, authentic assessments through that. Absolutely. Correct. They have standards that are very helpful. Yes. Okay, we have another question. Um, and, and this, if I'm asking something that will come up later in the presentation, uh, feel free to say, hey, we'll get to that. Um, but uh, Belita asked, how do you best transition students, especially more traditional undergrads, to be self-directed learners in this model? What kind of student support is needed? We, we are going to get into that a little bit more deeply in the presentation, but yeah. suffice it to say that um, it, takes a, uh, it takes a lot of support. It takes some unique approaches to supporting the student. Um, one of the things that we have done recently in the last 12 months actually is is to look back through and, and realize that when you're developing self-driven or self-motivated self-educated students one of the important things is to make sure not only that they they can drive into the knowledge but they have the skills for the tools that they're going to use to get there so we had to back up and create an entire course on just how to use the technology and the resources so that they had a great understanding before they began to pursue their career in education or their, their academic endeavors. Mm -hmm. That's great. Bob, I feel like we've answered your questions talking about um, setting competencies for humanities, history, um, and, you know, other programs that don't have a direct line to the, you know, to the, uh, to industry. And then we have one more we'll, we'll address right now. Um, Gabe asked, so how are your you put it in quotation marks, so you get my little fingers. Classes set up. Do you have traditional instructors or do you have coaches and what do they do? 
<laughs> we, we are going to address that a little later. <laughs> very deeply. <laughs> but, but suffice it to say, we have a disaggregated faculty model. Mm -hmm. Faculty approaches are different than, than uh, for us, are different than what you would see in a traditional model school. Um, there are mentors who are the, the content specialists that are always available to students and are highly used. There are also other mentors um, that do other functions and we'll get into that here in just a little bit. Great, I think we're ready to proceed on then. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, one of the things that uh, we really wanted to emphasize during our presentation is that there are some principles that lead to successful CBE programs. And again, as I said, we keep repeating that building them around real world standards and in industry accepted competencies. I always like to say, starting with the end in mind, if they are going to be working in a profession, we want to start with what they're going to have to do and then uh, back that into a program. Also, uh, <clears throat> as Chuck also stated earlier, you do have to have some flexibility for a student to pace through the program, but we hold standardized the curriculum and the assessments so that they still have all those experiences. One of the things that happens is a student may uh, be able to advance very quickly in portions of the program due to a variety of reasons. But also, we, as we know, life happens. And when life happens, then we have to be able to customize their pacing according to what they are experiencing to help them to be successful. The other key to this is uh, when you're establishing a CBE program, there are going to be certain services that are needed and certain learning resources that are needed. And one of the pieces is, is ensuring that those learning resources um, are very appropriate to that program that provides opportunity for them to have different types of experiences that would reflect what they would face out there in the profession. And often this is where um, your external stakeholders can be of great help in helping to identify what some of those can be. Another piece is everybody loves that word alignment, but once we have competencies um, established, we really do need to map them directly to courses and assessments. And that's extremely important because that alignment has to stay true and tight. In other words, it doesn't fluctuate from um, one term to the next. So that enables us to really determine when students have met the competencies. And that's why they're all so standardized, because you can't have one set of competencies and another set of competencies for the same program because there's too much variance in that. The other piece is about assessments. I don't know if you remember when you went to school, but I remember a little bit about, you know, a professor would give you an assessment and then they would grade it and then they would give it back to you, right? They would let you have your, the assessment. And then they, another class may be coming in, it's the same course, but they'd also uh, go ahead and they would assess those students. And of course, as you well know, students share assessments. That's what they do. And so none of that was secure. And none of that created like a test bank that could really assess what students know and what they're able to do. In uh, CBE, it is about uh, having experts to design assessments that we know will be reliable and valid because those assessments are determining if they've met the benchmark for the competencies. So they're very important because we have to trust them. One of the greatest investments, and I have uh, valued this a lot more uh, due to over in education, we have just created a new special ed program and that is my background. So I got to participate as an internal expert at the institution. And what we have were external stakeholders. We invited people who were uh, expert in the knowledge of special education. We invited practitioners from the field and they worked with us in setting up what uh, are the competencies that is needed for when 
a special educator enters the field, and also what are, uh, are all the assessments measuring that, and what are the types of performance tasks that would be needed to reflect what happens out in the field. So I came to really value external stakeholders because they really help to create a very balanced program, one that students will be very successful for, or what I call workforce, workforce ready. Also, um, we have to think about <clears throat> support personnel. And I'm not gonna say too much about that because we're gonna address it here in just a minute, but it is about a disaggregated faculty model. All right, and we'll explain that. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll, we're ready to move to the next slide and talk a little bit about some of the practices that support um, success with a competency-based education. And you'll see number one here, we have experts. Experts are the things that Werner was just talking about. We go out into the field, we get the experts who are practitioners, we get the experts who are, are, have a knowledge base um, and know the content and the, the uh, requirements of a particular program or course, and we bring them to the table. And they're really, in a way, your first line of curriculum development team. We have to have experts in curriculum design, which are part of the faculty, or it can be external SMEs or subject matter experts. But these curriculum design people um, are the ones who make sure that the assessments are psychometrically proven to, to demonstrate competence at the level they're supposed to, so that you're designing um, a, a curriculum that, that addresses the outcomes that you want. And the assessments measure those outcomes, the evaluations measure those outcomes, and they all work cohesively to make sure that um, you're really delivering to the student that knowledge base and the skill base that they need. Um, as far as instruction, that's part of the, the faculty that we use here. We do use a disaggregated model, and Verna will go into it a little bit here, and then I think we go into it more. But we have what we call course instructors, and they are experts in the content area of the course. And that course instructor is available to the student anytime they have a question, anytime they don't understand anything they can contact the course instructor which, who will give them feedback and some guidance. Um, but, but you have to remember that because of the flexibility of the program, the course is moving at a different pace for every individual student. So you need those, those, those course instructors that are available um, to answer questions on multi-levels from multiple students. Um, and then we have what we call the student mentors or the coaching. And the coaching model is that person who reaches out in weekly conversations with students. Vern alluded to the fact that life happens. Well, this is one of those support items that's very necessary for competency-based education. You need someone that reaches out to students and helps them through the process, um, keeps them on track, keeps them focused on their end goal. Otherwise, sometimes we go to Disney, right? Or we go on a cruise. We could go to the next slide, please. Verna, did you have anything to add to that before we move on? I think you might. Well, Chuck, the only thing I would say is that we, it's a disaggregated faculty model, but it's really an expert model. All the individuals that are performing the different roles are actually experts in those roles. Uh, you know, for example, an evaluator is a person that will evaluate student work, but they're also individuals who've been highly skilled at providing feedback that will guide the student to attain a competency. So it's a total expert model. And if I think back after 36 years in higher ed, I would say that um, whether it was in program development or in course development, a faculty member would pick up the course and design it. And then they would uh, teach it. And then they would design the assessment of it. And then they would evaluate it. And all of that was done by a single faculty member. So now all we do is split out that one role of a faculty member across multiple individuals who are experts in their areas. So, Bernard, you started in higher ed when you were two? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she was three. I was there. I was her uncle. <laughs> Served a lot of roles in higher ed. <laughs> so. 
Thank you, Verna, for adding that in. I, I, it's very important. It does allow each individual to focus in on becoming the expert in their role in mm -hmm. policy-based education. If we, so I think we've lost, I've lost the screen. I'm sorry, has everybody out there maybe lost the screen? Yeah, and now we're just seeing our beautiful faces in the brief <laughs> style of Zoom. So um, we'll get the slides back up here in just a minute. Um, you know what, while we've got the pause, you might be addressing this in the next slide, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Bob's question while we're doing this transition. Um, he asked, how do you address security with your assessments? Do you have to create new valid and reliable performance tasks before each term? Um, you know, so you don't get the copy and paste and post on on uh, one of those uh, unnamed websites where students buy answers. Well, I can use an illustration. When we designed the new SPED program or special education program, at the point of design, the courses were designed and the assessments were designed. And they're all standardized. So from term to term, that's not going to vary. Uh, underneath there are algorithms running um, with that in case an assessment is not working well then it can be tweaked uh, pretty immediately but what keeps it secure is that WGU holds that in their platform and that is an assessment that's delivered to all students that's in that program I don't know if that helps You know, I think it does. Um, you know, I would say one thing that, that um, we focus on and that is built into the quality, the CBIN quality framework, mm -hmm. is creating assessments that are authentic and that require, um, require students to cite sources and do, mm -hmm. um, do work that's original, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than mm -hmm. saying, you know, everyone's going to write a paper on the War of 1812 we would say, you know, maybe assume the, um, depending on what the course is, but, you know, assume the role of a historian who is documenting the War of 1812, create a public presentation for it using academic sources. Mm -hmm. So doing something that, that requires that um, individuality, I think that adds to it as well. In our program design that I referenced earlier in special education, one of the things that happened at the point of design in the courses was that we identified all the different performance tasks that a special educator would have to do in the field. And then those became the actual assessments. So for example, they have to be able to write and design behavior intervention plans. So that's a performance task that they will have to do as part of the program. Exactly. So I think you're going to address some of these other questions. So I'm going to hold them for our next pause and we can keep moving now. Okay, thank you. I, I think we still skipped one slide. So I'm going to go ahead and cover some things here. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so, so we want to talk about some of the strengths that support the conversion of CBE to CBE from a traditional model uh, program. And one of those we've alluded to a number of times and that's flexible pacing. And flexible pacing has, has um, given us several new types of students. Uh, one of them we call the, the, the sprinters. These are the people, the folk who take advantage and they accelerate through the program. So it's frightening the first time somebody comes in and completes a program in 12 months that you thought should take 18. That doesn't mean they didn't do it well. As somebody who's been 18 months. If your assessments are true, it's okay. Then we have the flexors. Those are people who come in and out. They're self-paced. They work within their own reasonable limits. Um, and that's the important thing to note here is that, that it's within a reasonable limit because even if it is CBE, it has to end sometime. Um, they need to, to demonstrate final mastery and move through. Um, but so, so even though they come and go, as long as they're staying on time, it's not hasn't been too frightening. Then we have the frequent flyers, the ones who enroll, they'll maybe do one or two courses, life happens, they go on, whatever, and then they stop and they wait a few months, they re-enroll, life happens, they go back out and they go back in. Again, it's very important to make sure that they're working at a pace that's within a reasonable time. 
but as long as they're progressing and they're demonstrating competence and mastery of the, of the materials, um, even though it's not our favorite thing to see, it's probably okay, right? And then there's the consistent enrollees, which is what we all want, and that's the person who enrolls in school, goes through time frames that we think are reasonable, demonstrate their mastery, graduate when you expect, life goes on. Um, but what CBE does is allow us through these models of students to reach out and serve students that are not particularly focused on the traditional education models that are 15 week semesters, for example, um, where a student doesn't have the ability to be a flexor, for instance, um, or a sprinter. Chuck, you may want to uh, explain how enrollment works rather than by term. Well, for us, and, and in, I think in most competency-based education models that I have observed, um, instead of enrollment on a, on a um, fall semester, for instance, uh, for us, we do, we do enrollment every six weeks. Some do it every four weeks, and we enroll cohorts of students. Um, and then they, they are in for a six-month term. And in that six-month term, they can complete as many assessments as they have the, the ability to, to demonstrate. So if you think of, a, of it as courses, where in a traditional model, you may have three courses and four courses in a 15-week semester, with our model of CBE and most that I've seen, a student can have as many courses as they can demonstrate mastery of, which is what allows the, the flexibility. Verna, does that answer your question, or would you like to? No, that answers it. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. <laughs> Some of the other strengths supporting conversion, and I'm not going to dwell on these because I think Verna did an excellent job explaining these um, in her demonstrations, but the fact is that competencies um, in CBE tend to be developed at a higher categorical level than just learning outcomes, which are traditionally used to, uh, to develop assessments. So it isn't focused in on just one aspect or one learning outcome, but, but the assessments are delivered to, to, to really measure as the student got a breadth of knowledge and abilities once they've completed the, the, uh, the program and the course. And that makes them, because we, we're looking at that and we're able to, to then determine is the student able to not only learn, but to apply and do, um, allows us to objectively measure those outcomes uh, because we're, we're measuring it against, are they, is, is this, are they doing what we wanted them to be able to do? Um, Brenna, would you like to add to that? Anything, I, your, your examples were so enlightening. I don't see the point. <laughs> I actually think you um, really nailed that one, Chuck. Um, I think it is hard to realize that uh, when I see our courses being developed, I'll see a competency, and underneath it will be multiple learning outcomes that are attained by that competency. So that's kind of how it's organized. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the other strengths for CPE is that, that it can be measured. There's a successful way to measure it. Um, and, and some of the things you're measuring are, is it flexible? Does it provide individual learning? Um, we've talked a lot about flexibility, but really that's one of the most important things or one of the important things about CPE um, is that you can have a flexible learning platform that's truly individualized. Um, it can reduce the time to completion because students can move through more quickly and be a sprinter, they, they reduce the overall cost of education. They're not paying for time. They're paying for knowledge. Um, it makes learning the key component, as I just said. They're not paying for that time. They're not sitting there in seats just to, to gain clock hours, but rather they're paying for the learning, and that's what we're measuring. It can be adjusted quickly to market demands or student needs. Um, I, I remember being in other programs where it might take a year to change course, but in CBE, we can do that more rapidly because we have direct connection to all the experts and we're able to roll. And because students are not admitted in a traditional format, we can make the change for students more quickly that are coming in. Um, there's also definitely an embedded process for the continuous improvement. 
Um, Air Quality Committee looks at all these things. Uh, one of them is the retention rates, and at CBE we have higher traditional uh, retention rates, or at least WGU, we've experienced higher retention rates than most um, online programs. I think that's well documented. And we've been very fortunate. Um, we can look at our graduation rates just like anyone else, although it's a little different. It's a, we're not just measuring. Because students are here at different time frames, you have to kind of follow a cohort of an individual rather than a cohort of time. Um, <laughs> On-time progression is something we measure very um, seriously in CBE. Um, when I was alluded to the fact that life happens and you want to make sure people, that students actually get through in a, a reasonable time frame, we, we do have an anticipation that students will complete a certain number of assessments within each six-month term so that we know that they are making progress toward graduation, time to completion. Um, and we also know that that if, if we can keep on time progress and try in in check, we can increase graduation rates. There's a direct correlation to the percent of on time progress to the graduation rate. And that's the important thing: that students graduate and have the skills they need. Um, it's easier to measure pacing. Um, it, it's not as difficult as you think. And of course, course engagement we measure that with every single course, every single assessment. Um, so. Um, we make sure that students are spending the time, sufficient time, um, to learn the skills that they don't have, but we also understand that students bring life experience, and so course engagement time may be shorter for those with more experience in a certain area. Um, one of the other strengths is the flexible staffing roles. Um, again, it allows our um, faculty and others to, to hone in their skills and be experts in a certain given area of instruction rather than expecting them to be the expert of all things. And next slide, please. I think we went backwards, yes. So while there are a lot of strengths, there are also some very big challenges to conversion of competency-based education. I think if we don't spend just a couple minutes um, talking about those, uh, we wouldn't we would be doing a disservice. First of all, it requires a very stable and a very strong leadership role at the institution. You have to have buy-in at the top. It's critical. Um, otherwise, it'll be let's go back to doing things the way they were. It's easier. Faculty engagement um, is something that, that is very important to CPE. Faculty have to believe in it, be invested in it, and want to do it. And I can tell you that faculty in the beginning often struggle with that change. And there, you might expect to be some faculty resistance, particularly maybe to giving up that traditional role of ownership of everything. Um, you have to be able to very, very well articulate the model that you choose direct assessment, time-based, um, and, and get help people to get past the antiquated beliefs that competency-based education is nothing more than a training program, because it isn't. Um, training programs are designed for just that, to train a certain item. Um, competency-based education is more than that. It's to measure the knowledge, the skills, and the applicability that people have once they've completed the assessment. Um, you need a strong staffing focus on continuous student support, and therein lies the reason we have the disaggregated faculty model, which I think most CBE programs use. Um, students need that constant contact and feedback, not direction necessarily, but feedback, and, and, and just contact. How's life going? How are things doing? Are you running into issues? Can we help you somewhere? Um, you know, flexibility, while well, we've talked a lot about the good things, remember it can be a liability. Life derails student plans all the time, just like they derail hours. Um, something else might become more important and we momentarily lose focus on where we're going. So having that ability to drop in and out sometimes can get in the way of students' progress. Um, it can be difficult, it can be challenged to build the meaningful measurable assessments that are used to determine competence. You must keep a clear focus on, in the very beginning, what is it that you want the 
outcome to be? What is it you want the student to look like when you're finished, when they're finished? And start building your assessments early to, to meet that outcome goal. And then there can be some very structural challenges within the uh, institution. And one of the, the biggest ones I've found, and, and we're not going to let you add into this, but it's been just the need to have this large data support system. You've got to have a lot of data to measure um, competency-based education to, to be assured that you're truly measuring accurately what you need to measure to demonstrate competence. Credit transfer can be a problem. I think somebody alluded to that in the questions. Um, and it can be, and I'm going to, to speed a little bit because I see we're running out of time and I want to leave some time for Q&A, but uh, it's one of the reasons WGU backward field into sort of a credit model from our direct assessment is because other universities didn't understand competency-based education, and so the transfer of credits can be a problem. Um, but I think once transcripts demonstrate the competency levels and the assessments and, and then it becomes more clear to the transferring uh, university that there's been a lot more acceptability to transfer students in and out. Um, the um, student support is not only necessary for success, but I wanna, we want to point out very critical that vendors are carefully resourced. Um, a lot of vendors out there that can promise you a lot of things, but making sure they really <laughs> you need is extremely important. Um, pricing model is, is important. You need to make sure that it's, re, you know, we, we, we try to make sure that we're reasonably priced. The students can really afford to do this, that it doesn't add to the burden, but it detracts from the financial burden. And yet we can still meet the programmatic goals, the mission and the statement of the, of the program. Um, it should be considered a standalone. Sometimes that's difficult rather than a part of your traditional model. It is truly a, a, an entirely different way to think about educating students. Um, there, um, there are some issues of the credit hour measurements, and, and I know there's still some resistance to that, but there are a lot of institutions out there that demonstrate that X amount of time reading, X amount of time writing translates over to X amount of credit hours. So there are ways to do that um, if it's needed to do. And then tools. There are some, as I alluded to earlier with the vendors that are proven to be effective and some haven't. So you need a, a team of experts to really vet those tools before you ever go live with your students. Those have been some of the biggest challenges I think we, we've seen. Verna, are there others that you'd like to add before we get a question? No, I think it's probably time for questions. I think you handled that quite well. <laughs> All right, that's where I jump back in. So, um, let's see, the first question that we have here, I'm gonna take them in order and we'll get through what we can until uh, we need to close. And as Megan said, we'll take the rest of them and compile answers and share those uh, on the website with the archive of the webinar and the slides. So Bonnie asks, it appears that a high degree of centralization slash central control over the curriculum is required to make all of the pieces fit together. How do you accommodate rapid change in competencies in fields that are constantly in flux, i.e. in uh, computing studies? I well, Chuck, I don't know if you want to start or me start. <laughs> Go ahead, Verna. <laughs> One of the things is, is it, it's part of the design. It is true. Uh, Chuck and I are also in rapidly changing fields that has been uh, somewhat of a big change, uh, particularly in education, that it now changes so rapidly. So one of the things is, is when you uh, design it, one of the pieces underneath that is you're watching through those big data systems that you have, you're watching how things perform. So if you need to change something, you can do that because the data is going to tell you you need to change something. If you need to add something in that is essential to the field because something has changed, you don't have to recreate a whole course. You can actually go right into that course and make those changes and keep that moving forward. 
And and Verna, the only thing I would add to that um, is is it's critical to keep those experts close by and keep the communication lines mm -hmm. open because that makes for a rapid transition rather than having to pull it all back together and start over. Exactly. Uh, so I'm going to go on to our next question. Um, Adriana says, do WGU instructors slash experts do the curriculum slash course design or do you use a third party? We do not use, <laughs> we don't use a third party to do our curriculum. We use, we use a, a model that, that includes our um, community of interest experts out there and then our faculty. Um, and we have a department who are experts at creating and building. They don't do that on a standalone. They do that in conjunction with and under the guidance of the faculty and the, and the experts out there. Um, the third party vendors are utilized to provide a platform. Right. For our curriculum. And I would say that's probably pretty standard. Some people mm -hmm. do use outside, you know, instructional design help. Mm -hmm. but um, often using your own subject matter experts. So, uh, Bob, I think we'll take one more question because Megan has a little bit of wrap up to do. So Bob's question is focused on, um, he says, since students are moving at different paces, does the model allow for student to student interaction? And do you feel that's important? It does. Our model allows for this. Any competency-based education model can have built into it. Uh, we call our student communities, which is where students mm -hmm. can get together and throw back ideas. They can they can discuss a course. They can discuss um, an assessment tool or a learning tool. Um, and so they they do help each other. Yes. Sometimes course uh, instructors uh, we've been having. Uh, they have developed some uh, mini webinars in which all the students may join and they might run them several times, but it allows for the students to discuss things with one another. Mm -hmm. Megan, should I ask, ask one more or do you want to jump in now? Go ahead, Kelly. Okay. So Herb asked, the biggest issue most schools have with flexible entry and exit is how to apply federal financial aid and how to compensate instructors. How do you all compensate your instructors? We, well, I mean, we have, we, <laughs> we have faculty. We, we have, just, just like any school would have faculty and they're paid a salary, uh, just mm -hmm. like at, at any school. Um, in terms of, you know, where do those resources come from? They come from the tuition the students pay. But um, as far as the, uh, what was the other part of the question was about financial aid? Yeah, right? yeah. the other part of the question was, um, you know, that there's issues to starting up in CBE because of mm -hmm. federal financial aid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was one of, the, one of the other reasons in the early days we had to backtrack and put in some credit hours because even though the, D, the, the department was, writing rules to allow for competency-based education. They hadn't yet solidified that, but, but we haven't had any issues um, gaining financial aid for our students. They are allowed to, to access the federal dollars like any school. Um, our curriculum has been accepted um, as a standard uh, and, and our outcomes measures and, and our, our data have supported the fact that students are learning and, and uh, gaining their skills. Go ahead, Verna. One of, one of the pieces around that is that all institutions have to establish terms for that Title IV authority. And so we run two six-month terms. But it's the other reason why we run on-time uh, progress of students. Uh, we are really monitoring that they have met certain uh, milestones, and that's what enables them uh, to receive financial aid because they are all full-time students. So... <clears throat> Uh, that is highly monitored, but what we have to meet is satisfactory academic progress. And so we have actually a, a calculated way to do that in this process. Yep, and, that, and I would say that varies across institutions mm -hmm. um, and it varies across the different models of CBE, mm -hmm. right? So you guys use a course-based CBE, we use direct mm -hmm. assessment. Correct. So different process that you have to go through with the Department of Ed to gain approval for that. So 
Um, there are lots of great resources out there. Um, I put some in the chat box and then, you know, um, I can, I'm happy to, to share more if you have direct questions as well on financial aid, especially for direct assessment. So, um, okay, okay. I'm, I'm going to jump in to so wrap up. We are at the top of the hour, but I just wanted to say thank you to Callie, Verna and Chuck. This was really worthwhile. Callie, thanks so much for jumping in to moderate this series. And if you haven't registered yet, be sure to join us for part two on March 14th. And I will send a recording, a link to the recording as well as the PowerPoint slides out shortly after this. But I just wanted to also give a quick nod to our supporting members and our sponsors that underwrite much of our programming and events here at WCT and help make this all possible. So again, thanks for your time. Thanks for your great questions and your interactivity. And I'll be in touch soon. Have a great day, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys.